Hello everyone and welcome to lesson six of our online course on online teaching, which unfortunately will be our last lesson. Uh, today with us to talk about assessment while online teaching are Magella Dempsey and Anthony Malone from Maynooth University. So Anthony and Magella, thank you very, very much for being here with us. And um, I'm going to start with the screen sharing so that we can get right into it. Okay, so um, thanks Alice. Magella and I are delighted to be uh, asked to do this and I know it's the final session so we're even more privileged to be in that position. Um, I suppose in this session the aims are pretty straightforward. We're really considering just issues, some strategies when assessing remote learning which we know has been uh, a particularly interesting and uh, pressing issue for a number of your members itself. But before we get into it, just in terms of the next slide, Alice, if you could. Um, I think what we really wanted to, to start off uh, is to, I suppose, to just acknowledge, I suppose, the challenging, unprecedented times that we're very much living through. It's, it's history in the making in many respects. And um, the current global crisis has certainly stirred up a whole newfound or actually a rediscovered uh, respect for teachers and the complexity of the work that they actually do. And we know that you know different systems and different countries are in different places uh, from when this series of uh, uh, short sessions began. Some countries are already opening up with schools returning. I know here in Ireland, uh, our schools are not due to return until September. Um, so we're all in different places and we acknowledge that. But I think there's also just a couple of things we'd, we'd like to say. Um, over the past number of months, we see so many stories from various different stakeholders, teachers, students, parents, and so on and so forth. Uh, just about that, I suppose, respect for teachers and uh, respect for the work that they do. And what we see is this kind of proven ability to really adapt when the going gets tough uh, and to really differentiate uh, regardless of students in many respects, regardless of context, that ability to really differentiate uh, for the students, for the different subjects, for the different contexts. I'm particularly taken as Magella, uh, with the just sheer creativity that's gone out, on out there. We've so many wonderful examples of teaching approaches, of people really taking a solution-focused approach to their teaching and to learning itself. So we just wanted to begin the session I suppose starting in that way, just praising teachers and indeed praising organisations like Euroclio uh, for the important work that you do in terms of supporting teachers that the work that they do. Magella? Um, next slide. So, um, hello everybody and we're delighted to be with you today and I echo everything that Anthony has said. So just to start off, what we take when we're thinking about assessment, what is good practice in assessment? And really what we say is that it needs to be aligned and integrated into the teaching and learning process. It can't be something that just comes at the end. And I, um, I think you will see what we mean by this as we go along. It is also good to, uh, to draw on a diverse range of assessment methods and strategies. So rather than just thinking about paper-based essays, that we might think about students producing videos, doing some project work, maybe doing some art or some modeling for as part of their assessment. And this sort of assessment really adds to the validity of the work. Um, and it's, assessment is best supported through embedding a strengths-based approach that seeks to identify and build on the existing capacities rather than a deficit-based approach. So what you're looking for here is, how can I let my students show me what they have learned? Mm. And it is best cultivated through active learning tasks. And I think this also, we're all worrying about the validity of our assessments in this online space. So how can we be assured that it is the student's work and maybe not their older brother or sister or maybe their parents. So to add to this validity, it is good to do it through active learning tasks. So the student might be asked to go out into their community and to look at a historical monument and to do some sort of a commentary on it, like as if they were doing a TV or a radio show. And it's best assessed through formative-based assessment. 
And this really complements where relevant to summative assessment. And I suppose the difference is when you're looking at formative assessment, you're helping the student to build on their strengths, but to also see what they need to do to, to bring those strengths and competencies further. Whereas our summative assessment, which of course we need, because we need a kind of an end point that will tell us where the student is at. And this is your, your, like your exam, your written exam. So in the online space, it, a formative assessment becomes even more important because students are missing those cues that they get in class, mm -hmm. the cues to get from you, the teacher, but equally the cues to get from their peers or from listening to a peer answer a question or listening to how somebody gets something wrong and how that is um, talked about. And so formative assessment is more, it, it, they are process and outcomes based rather than solely outcomes driven. So the question, the next slide, the question we would ask would be, how can your students demonstrate understanding of their learning? And this is where, what we mean when we say that it needs to be knitted in and part of the teaching and learning. So you link assessment to the curriculum aims in your subject. So whatever topic it is or whatever area you're, you're doing with your students, you're thinking about, well, what were the curricular aims? And if possible, you could develop learning intentions with your students using those curricular aims. But even if you're now looking back at some learning and teaching that has already happened, let the action verbs of those curricular aims guide you as to how you might assess them. So in other words, if you talk about describe an early settlement, if you use the word describe, then you, you want the student to be, to be able to illustrate, to be able to, to, in some way, use their own words or their own images to describe what you mean by that. Um, so it could be critique. If it's a critique, then you want them to give two sides, the pros, the cons, or maybe the positives and the challenges, or if, if it's evaluate. So in other words, those action verbs are very, very important. And I think what what really helps, and especially in the online space, where you don't have those cues that you have in real-time teaching, is if you can co-construct success criteria with your students for assessment. So in other words, help your students to see what does a good piece of work look like? So even use pro formas or use examples, or maybe with them in a chat space, get them to say, well, what might a good answer look like? What might a good essay look like? What might a good picture? What might a good model look like? And it really helps them to see what success looks like. And then finally, the next slide, we, we, we talk, there is a dilemma, and we have it here in Ireland, and I'm sure it is right across the world, this dilemma around that students might have limited access to Wi-Fi. Some students don't have their own um, iPads or Surface Pros or whatever it is that are being used, or maybe they're relying on their parents uh, using some of their parents' devices. So there's a few dilemmas, and we don't. Re I won't take too much time to go through them, but I suppose one is that we make sure that we're inclusive in our assessment. So in other words, that students have various ways of showing us what they've learned. So mm -hmm. if they can't do a real-time video, if that is beyond their capabilities with the technology to have, that we equally allow them to do a, pa a, a paper version, and then they can take a picture and send that to us. Or that we allow them to do a voice recording, so like a WhatsApp voice recording, or we allow them to maybe um, send an email with an attachment or so on. But equally, we have to be really careful about GDPR and we're all and about, about protecting our students' identity and protecting their personal information. So all of this has to be negotiated between you and your students. But thankfully, an awful lot of this is done at school level, but mm -hmm. we always have to be careful of it. So that some formats, such as WhatsApp, which I've just mentioned, but which we do use a lot with our students, is not GDPR compliant. So we have to think about, well, what does your school recommend in that situation? Thank you. Next slide. So just on that, I mean, I suppose really what we're saying is, you know, think about what's possible for them 
uh, forge as cl close as possible a relationship with those in parenting roles. So you really get a sense of, well, what's happening at home in that kind of remote online space? And because I think very often the, the other adults in the relationship, those in the parenting roles, they're very close to it. And we'll come back to this later on. Um, but they know really what's possible, what's working, what's creating the level of stress and what's not in many respects. So in any assessment kind of process, what we're really trying to think about is what is possible for them and indeed for ourselves. I mean, what we want to make sure is that it's going to work. And maybe that's a conversation that needs to happen at whole school level or at subject department level or so on. But certainly having that close as possible relationship with home is really, really important. And also just don't lose sight. I mean, Magella has really unpacked them very well there. Just don't lose sight of the kind of important features which really guide good assessment. Uh, so things like, for example, recognizing the value of using multiple approaches and strategies itself. So Magella has mentioned this, not really relying on that kind of standard kind of essay response, but varying it and encouraging students in many respects through very different action verbs to take on different kinds of tasks where they get to show different kinds of skills, knowledge, values, attitudes, and so on and so forth. And we really can't stress that enough, uh, that valuing and that variation of different approaches, different strategies itself. And doing so actually acts as a stimulus for the students because we know one of the kind of key, I suppose, difficulties of remote learning, and it's something that's been spoken time and time again the last number of months, is the levels of boredom that students are, are uh, experiencing. So again, thinking about what's possible for them, but also varying what's possible, uh, I think is really, really important. Just that point about uh, the levels of boredom, I think it is particularly important, just prioritizing active learning tasks. Now, Magella has spoken of this, but just to reiterate it, the vast majority of tasks that, you know, that we hear about online sometimes are about task completion, about knowledge acquisition, uh, about, as I say, uh, skills acquisition. And just think about the variation there of what is possible. Magella gave lots and lots of examples, some from the arts, just creative kind of approaches in many respects. So prioritizing learning tasks, but then thinking about the implications of that for the assessment piece itself. And of course, we want to draw in that formative piece. Uh, Magella mentioned that students the piece that they're missing, and they're missing many things about not being in school, is those kind of social cues. The social cues of being sitting in a room, the cue that they get from the teacher, the cue that they get from their, their peers, that kind of social interaction stuff that's so, so important. So keeping in mind that assessment isn't just something that is outcomes-based, but also very process-based. Uh, there's a formative dimension that's really important and important to keep that in mind in many respects. Um, so thinking about the process, I've mentioned the boredom, reflecting on the nature and the diversity of tasks, the fun element. I'm conscious myself, I have young children, and that is the piece that they constantly talk about to me, is that learning isn't as much fun, uh, which is a real pity to hear of. Uh, so what we need to do is think about that kind of fun element that they have when they're in school um, and of course involving students you know you don't have to be the one that's totally responsible for all the assessing and in fact not everything that you set as an assessment task needs to be graded giving students responsibility uh, for self or for peer assessment is actually a very important kind of aspect and very important part of the assessment process. And Magella has mentioned that, and I think done a really kind of given a really good explanation to it in many respects, getting them involved in the success criteria, you know, giving them examples of what a good piece of work might look like or what your expectations for a piece of work might look like, and then drawing them into that kind of peer and self assessment in many respects. And of course, reflecting the necessity for feedback and differentiating uh, in that feedback itself. If everything is simply marked as very good, you know, good job uh, in that response, because there are all kinds of ways that we can give feedback remotely and online. And um, so just going a little bit beyond that, for example, if possible, uh, and getting permissions from parents 
to actually share samples of students' work. So if students have produced a particular project, uh, whether it's an art-based project or whatever it might be, um, one of my own uh, children last week, their teacher set them a task to basically make a historic event using food. So to recreate uh, an image of a historical event using food. And they had to take a picture and upload it onto the system. The teacher shared all the boys' pictures. They were then online later on in gaming and so on and so forth, talking to each other about each other's pictures. So assessment can be carried on in many respects and in various different ways. Uh, but I really do think differentiating the feedback is important because if the response is, uh, you know, if the response is just good or good job or very good, the reality is that students don't have that kind of clear sense of what is a good piece of work and what's not such a good piece of work. And so you're all the time trying to use assessment to motivate them in terms of their own learning. And that comes back to the expectations piece that Magella spoke about earlier on, that kind of creating the expectations and working with them in a way that's going to motivate them for the learning experience. Okay, so next slide. So um, we spoke earlier about these action verbs. Another way of thinking about assessment and how you can push it a little bit further is to think about the, the question stems that are based on Bloom's taxonomy. And I, I suppose there's a, you're, you're moving up along between knowledge and then comprehension, application analysis, synthesis, and evaluating. So if you look at the last two, they're a good place to start when you're at this stage of, a, of a, a block of learning, say, since Christmas. So what do you think about? What would you prioritize? What do you think is the most important? So you're asking the students to make decisions and to kind of to not sit on the fence but to, and to defend those decisions. So they have to look through various types of information in order to defend them. How would you determine? What solutions would you suggest? And um, I think these can be helpful, especially if you're thinking about doing multiple choice questions, that you include a, a variety of different levels of questions in your multiple choice, which is a, a very valid way of assessing learning at this stage of the year. And it's actually very teacher friendly because you can, the, the system, if you do it with Google documents, you can, the system does the marking for you. But equally, you can see where the student might be missing out in certain key learning. So th this is just a, a tool that can be helpful. So just coming back to that kind of differentiated piece, because it is something that we see on social media quite a lot, and even from talking to teachers and indeed parents, they actually talk about the challenges. You know, if you've got particularly demands on Wi-Fi or Wi-Fi that for example, isn't as reliable as you might hope it would be. And um, the reality is that most learning in schools and teaching in schools, it happens in a very synchronous way. It happens in that live way. Um, so actually the need is to be flexible with students, to kind of allow them to work in asynchronous ways that they might not complete the homework or the, the schoolwork by a particular time, or they might not be able to go on live for a particular classroom and so on and so forth. So being flexible, and that's where we come back to, the, to connecting in with people, building the relationship, getting to know what's possible and what's not. That takes time and of course it's challenging itself. But most schools now have various platforms, for example, Microsoft Teams, Google Classroom, all of these are GDPR compliant. Magella has made this point and I'm not going to reiterate it too much, but again, it's really getting to know kind of the systems that your school has and what the features are and what's possible for you. Talking with colleagues, working out what's possible, how they're doing things, and of course, getting ideas from them. Um, but of course, there's lots of ideas and there's lots of options on these particular platforms. And I'm especially taken with many of them that are so user friendly, very intuitive, very easy to use. Um, for example, as I say, Google Classroom, which is a, is a 
is a typical one, or indeed Microsoft Teams. And you can do certain things like, for example, you can dedicate certain chat channels to certain topics, allows you to, uh, you know, Magella mentioned kind of voice messaging, like the audio messaging, and um, it allows you to do all of that. So to create that kind of safe, closed space where you could put up audio messages, you could put up videos, you could put up photographs, samples of, of work and so on and so forth, but they're in these dedicated channels that students can access, and that's a closed channel. Uh, so again, helping them to organize their learning. But also within those, you can create separate topics. All of these are searchable. So, you know, if you're saying to students, look, do you remember when we looked at a particular aspect of history? Uh, so what you're trying to do is to, I suppose, help them to be organized in their own learning, but also that they're not losing sight of the learning itself. So thinking about the clutter that can build up uh, and trying to minimize that in many respects. Um, conversation and collaboration. We know that students who haven't yet returned to schools, that's the piece that they talk about, missing their friends, you know, being able to kind of just have that social interaction. And while it's not the same, but having those kinds of conversation or collaborative tabs just allows class members to contribute, those that wish to contribute uh, and to, con to contribute to particular tasks and so on and so forth. So again, creating opportunities for social interaction. And of course, in that as well, I think is a real opportunity to, to progress their learning. And of course, there's lots of opportunities like quizzes, uh, multiple choice that Magella has spoken about, real opportunities to create all of these kinds of assessment tools, but actually some of them even self-mark. Uh, and there's lots of those kinds of tools where students can take, you know, they answer 20 questions and they get an instant result. You got 20 are correct or you got 15 correct and here's the ones that perhaps weren't as great. So it takes the pressure off teachers, but also gives them some sense of responsibility and in fact motivates them as well in the sense of you've got those wrong, you really not want to know where you went wrong and so on and so forth. So these tools, they're out there. We're in a really privileged position that they're very advanced tools and of course they're GDPR compliant. But again, the opportunity for teachers to go back to their schools and find out what, what is in place. And I'm sure teachers have already done that. Okay. Can, I, can I just add, um, don't be afraid to use uh, group assessments. Like at, at the third level uh, for our, to, to buy a, a course I was teaching this year at degree level, I used a group assessment. And I, I think that what uh, Anthony has really alluded to this and he's very much knows about it through his own experience and he, the, the, that social aspect of learning that he talked about with his sons. Um, I'd love to see a picture of that food historical event, Anthony. Um, but the, what I found was that you, you, take, you think that these students are, are communicating across because they're playing games or doing whatever, but some students can, can fall through the cracks and can not have anyone communicating with them. Yeah. And what a group assessment will do is that at least you know those five students that you've yeah. put together for a group assessment, they have to communicate in order to agree on the final piece of work that they're going to upload. So while it might seem like it's a, a lazy way out for us teachers to have less <laughs> assignments to mark, it actually really works with yeah. helping that collaborative uh, work that peers can learn from each other ahead of coming to the teacher to get a final mark. And I really would, encourage people to use group assessments especially this year with the virtual environment and try and encourage students to communicate more outside of the the class setting that we have i think that's a really brilliant point because um a lot of the technology too i mean people might call it surveillance but actually can help us in the sense that uh, when you access a particular site or when you make a contribution it's time stamped so the teacher gets a good sense of of the four or of the five in that group, one of the students or two of the students hasn't been in all that frequently at all. Or so it's a it's a chance not to kind of, you know, I suppose it's it's not about classroom management and it's not about surveillance, but it is that kind of pastoral piece that Magella has spoken about, that inclusion piece. And really good assessment should be very inclusive. Uh, so Magella has made that point very well. And I agree, I think group collaborative tasks are definitely the way to go. And they enjoy them. They really love doing them. There's no doubt about that. Okay. 
So um, the, I suppose the only final point that I would like to make um, is that you should make it fun. And Anthony has said this already, but I can't, I want to reiterate it. I, I think that assessment shouldn't be seen as something that is the kind of the hard part of the difficult part of the learning process. I think assessment should be fun. It, it's a way for them to show what they know, but it's also a way for us as teachers to identify the gaps in their knowledge. And sometimes it's gaps that we are responsible for because we didn't teach in the uh, maybe as comprehensively as we could have but it's really important for them to know their gaps as they move into next year and you know we're going to have a very tentative start to the year next year in learning trying to see where students are at i know some countries are already back to teaching but as it, as anthony said we're not so the, i i i really think that we have to think of assessment as giving the students the opportunity to show what they know and if we do that I think we will have valid and reliable as, uh, assessments. And I suppose not to get ourselves too, in this virtual environment, to try and just assess in as, in as valid a way as we can, but that sometimes we have to think about the reliability more important in these sort of times. So in other words, are we assessing the work that these students have done, what they have covered, what they should know, and giving them every opportunity to show that. Yeah, I think I think just uh, well said, Magella. I, I think there are just a couple of things that I'd like to add to that, and it's a point that Magella raised just about collaboration. Um, and what we're hearing are kind of stories of all kinds of isolation and all kinds of a sense of alienation, and uh, really good teaching and really good learning and really good assessment really has that right at the heart of everything it does. That sense of bringing people into a space, making them feel included, giving themselves a sense of confidence around their own learning and in fact their own identity of themselves as learners. And, and feedback, we've mentioned it, is a really important part of that. So the nature of the task and the assessment task is particularly important. Um, but so too is the feedback. And I've mentioned just differentiating across that feedback because feedback isn't just about telling them how well they know something or that you've, as we've mentioned, you've got 20 out of 20, but it also is that pastoral aspect of motivating them, you know, giving them that sense that they're involved in something and that they matter and that they really do matter to you itself, but also the opportunity for them to be involved in the assessment, you know, opportunities for them to, you know, self-correct for example, through technology, uh, peer assess, and so on and so forth. And just the final kind of point that I, I would make is um, just building that relationship with uh, those that are at home, those that are working remotely, those that are supporting the child, the student in their learning itself. And we know that, for example, that those that are in parenting roles, they often lack and there's lots of research to back this up and we have it we know it anecdotally anyway you know those that are in the parenting role often lack the familiarity with the subject matter that's been you know presented the task and so there's a real sense of needing to build a relationship there uh, to create a partnership around the kind of learning process in many respects and that final point reflecting on what's possible for those in a parenting role, building close relationships where possible. Families often less prepared than school professionals to work at home, but where families are really good is they know their own child. They know what's possible. They know how things are going and so on and so forth. Um, so it's that sense of, you know, really engaging with people. And there are all kinds of anxieties around assessment, and particularly setting work that needs to be completed remotely and at home. For example, some uh, of those that are in parenting roles over the last number of months, I'm particularly taken with the numbers of them that are feeling high levels of anxiety. Uh, these are the adults now, high levels of guilt, for example, that they're now in a different role with their child. Uh, sometimes they're playing roles where they're enforcing and you must do this and you must have this completed and so on and so forth. And some, uh, due to their own work commitments or whatever it might be, feel that they're not able to support their, their, the child uh, as much as they would like. So 
I think in many respects, the point we began with about being flexible and just being kind and being kind to yourself, I think is particularly important, especially in these times of crisis. You know, we're good people and we do good work and it's important to remind ourselves of that and not lose sight of just how much we do matter and how much the work that we do, that we do and the work, the work that we set, how much that actually matters too. Stephanie? Well, thank you. Thank you both very, very much for the presentation, which I will stop sharing. Uh, it was extremely interesting. I only have two questions, which is not only because it's two. <laughs> the first one is um, you mentioned the, the fact that it would be great to uh, develop the learning intention with the students. And I was wondering how you see it happen in a, in a classroom. Uh, is it the teacher that says we're going to talk about this and what do you think you're going to learn? How does that work? So, yeah, um, so you, you take the, the curriculum area, so either from your, your state curriculum. Mm -hmm. And so it will be quite broad um, curriculum area. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of a history example, not being a history teacher. Um, and then with the students, you 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 develop what the, the learning intention is. So it is, it, our, it is our intention with this period of learning, whether it's only one class or three classes mm -hmm. or five classes, that we will learn the following key points around this topic. So it could be that you want to just learn about what, what were the key historical moments that led mm -hmm. to something. Or it might be you want to learn about what was the outcome from that. So you, you discuss it with the students and you decide on the learning intention so that they're very clear as to what, when they've reached that end point in their learning. And in this, at the same time, you can discuss how maybe you would assess it and then discuss what the success criteria might be. Exactly. That sounds very interesting. And because the if, we don't, if we don't do that, the chances are that the students themselves don't really know what matters and they don't really know what success looks like. So there is a kind of an ego element uh, to all assessment. And I'm not saying egotistical, but an ego element in the sense of confidence and building a confidence, but also that sense of partnership and drawing them into that relationship of learning, which matters. Sorry. <laughs> no, sorry uh that's what well, that makes so much sense and i kind of wish that my history teachers when i was in high school did that but yeah i'm i'm glad that we put it out there for the participants to the course and the other question that i have is about feedback i really like what you anthony said about the, the need to give feedback not only because you want the student to know what they understood and what they didn't understand but also because you want them to to, to go back to this human con to, to, to this level of human content and it drove me back to the first lesson that we had with Richard and uh, Jacek who mentioned the fact that well Jacek men mentioned that he has sort of appointment hours where he's just available online for students to go and ask all their questions and so on and Richard he mentioned that he uses um, Google quizzes but then he goes and he looks at the results of the quizzes and he tries to give feedback to their students about the content. And I was wondering if there's any uh, good advice on how to give feedback, because I know that there's a lot of teachers out there that found themselves having to teach massive amounts of students online, which we, we understood after these two months and a half of lockdown, that requires more time than preparing face-to-face -face lessons. So, um, when the mo when the amount of students is so huge, uh, do you have any advice about feedback for for students? Yeah, I think I think sometimes we we take the view that feedback has to be personalised and it has to be individualised, but actually, really good feedback can be quite generic. In fact, it could be a comment to the entire group, like thanking them for the work that they've done. You know, you were really taken with you know this aspect or that aspect or whatever that speaks to the group where that when they read it they get a sense of oh yeah they had a look at my work or whatever teachers i completely agree i think teachers are under enormous pressure and um, but we know feedback matters and we know that sense that if we don't do the feedback piece that the students themselves lose that sense of motivation not all of them but some will 
So giving feedback in timely ways, uh, because if it's given too late, then it doesn't have quite the same impact that we would hope. But also it doesn't have to be always individual. It could be really love the fact everybody got above 15 out of 20 in the in the test last week, you know. Um, there were a couple of things that, you know, a number of you went down on or whatever, that you're speaking almost generically. Um, but I think if, if where possible, just being able to give, you know, a short piece of feedback every now and again to the student to just show them that you haven't lost sight of them as individuals either. Um, because that can happen, and Magella has spoken about that, the need to be inclusive. And assessment is a great way to kind of, just to, I suppose, give people a sense that they really do matter and that they're part of a community rather than simply just completing tasks because they have to. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question. I'm certainly very sympathetic to teachers and the heavy workload. Magella and I are testament to it as well, because we've been teaching and assessing online for months now, and uh, we're certainly aware of just the sheer challenge of it. So coming back to a point I finished on about just being kind to ourselves um, and just trusting ourselves. Yeah. And if I could add just um, two two pieces of advice to teachers that it's linked to my um, earlier point about using group assessments. Mm -hmm. So but when you use group assessment, the feedback goes into this semi-public space. So when you get the group assignment, the teacher can do feedback on that group assignment, but all five students are seeing the feedback. You don't know which student it is that wrote that particular part of the assignment. Mm -hmm. So I'm just talking about a written assignment in this case. But it's very, very helpful because you, you, you're you kind of removing the, you're not assessing the student, you're assessing the, the, the task, which is what we always should do. Mm -hmm. So when you're putting the feedback on it, it's very focused on the task and on the, those kind of ta technical aspects of the task. And so that is really powerful. The second thing that I would advise is that as teachers, if we can develop self-assessment um, rubrics for students. So in other words, if I'm getting my students, and I'm sorry again to talk about a written task, but I could equally talk about mm -hmm. that model made with the food. So you could have a self-assessment rubric, which is you use five different foods. You, you represent the, the model is um, obvious to any observer without a commentary. The model contains to historical events or whatever. So in other words, that the student then does a self-assessment ahead of submitting the assessment to you and they can mark off on that self-assessment. Um, so I think that those two are important and then that eventually it does all come out into the public sphere. So in other words, I, I certainly find that at university level, what I find really powerful is if I do feedback on assignments, that I post those assignments where everybody can look in and look at the assignments. And so they're able to see, oh, well, and they're getting examples then of good work. And they're also getting examples of, oh, here's what's really poor work looks like. And this is what the Magella has said about it. So I think that that can be helpful because at least you're not having to do 30, 40 different feedbacks. You can break it down into six sets of five or whatever, eight sets of five. <laughs> Can I also say as well that they're, depending on platforms, but there are quite a number of platforms where feedback doesn't have to be written. It can actually be an audio file. Um, so, and that creates the kind of a personal touch uh, in many respects as well, because they get to hear the voice of the teacher. Um, and that's not as onerous, but it, it ties in very much with what Magella is saying. So there are all kinds of systems and ways out there that really can support us. And the point that Magella has made and we've made throughout the presentation around self peer assessment, building a relationship with them, creating that sense of responsibility amongst them. But it's all about the relationship in many respects and trying to work with them to build that kind of a relationship. Okay, well, thank you very, very much. Uh, also for the replies to the questions. I think it was, I think it was a great presentation and I think it was a great way also to close up our course because uh, assessment, has never been like out there spoken about in our presentations, but throughout the lessons, we sort of touched upon it a little bit. So we had um, 
workshop hosts that were talking about how to avoid students boredom and disengagement so for example Helen presented you know the base techniques that you could potentially use also when doing online teaching but we also talked a lot about the need to differentiate tasks to be flexible and asynchronous and I think some of the tasks would connect quite well with what you said now I'm thinking of uh, Ute, for example, spoke about the use of sources and how she asks her students to do YouTube videos with sources that they found. Uh, or Sally, she has um, a, a box, uh, oh, she already did it in her classroom. She had a box where she asked students to record short messages about a task and then she would record the answers and give it to them. I mm -hmm. think I think what you said uh, at the beginning about the creativity that we have seen is so so true. Uh, we've seen what well, Hannah she uses Canva. She she's going to ask her students to create a magazine cover about Marx uh, to see what they understood about Marx and the right. um, proletarian movement, which I, I find hilarious, and I so mm -hmm. hope that she will send us some of the covers that they make. And yeah, I think, I think it was great to have this presentation that sort of brought together everything that was already out there underlying and really showed us that assessment is underlying or should be underlying to the tasks that we design and the lessons that we design, which I think is, I mean, I, I believe it's a very good point. And I think it was already quite clear in all the other presentations that we had. But also I really like how you framed the students at our alive as teachers allies so uh, they're not there to be judged but they're there also to help you with everything and I love the idea that assessment should be fun I think that should always be out there so yeah thank you very very much for your time thank you and and yeah and thank you very much to everyone who has followed this course uh, unfortunately this is the last lesson but yeah we're gonna be back with more courses and more speakers so you can find us on all social medias we're on twitter we're on instagram we're on linkedin and we're on facebook we're out there just reach out to us let us know if there's any other topic that you would like to see in a course in a webinar we're now designing our calendar for 2020 2021 so we're there anthony and Magella, thank you very 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 much for today and uh, i hope to speak with you soon and take care so far thank you alice take care